<laughs> All right. Good morning, everyone. We're going to get started here bright and early on a Saturday morning. Thank you for all of you who are on time, A+. Um, my name is Ashley Dare. Many of you saw me yesterday, and today I get to switch roles and introduce the speaker. I'm an associate professor at Virginia Tech in the Department of Fish and Wildlife Conservation, and also this year, the social science advisor for National Audubon Society. I uh, just wanted to briefly say a few things about Virginia Tech, one of the co-hosts of the conference. Um, it, at Virginia Tech and the College of Natural Resources, we have several human dimensions researchers. Graduate students are welcome to join us for graduate degrees in forest resources and environmental conservation or fisheries and wildlife. Additionally, we have an undergraduate track in human dimensions in our wildlife conservation major, as well as in our um, fish conservation major, which based upon my analysis across the country of, of curriculum, I think is pretty innovative. Um, so, uh, and, and of course we welcome collaborators, colleagues, anyone who's down in Southwest Virginia area to stop by Blacksburg, Virginia and say hi to us or even better speak with our students. So please reach out. So I'm pleased to be one of the co-hosts of the conference. It's been a great opportunity to see old friends, meet new friends, and hear all of the great research and application that's going on in our field, and to share time talking about challenges and also ways that we solve those challenges. I thank you all for being part of that. I'd also like to thank um, the folks that I've hosted this conference with, Mike Manfredo, and of course, Emily LeBanc, the amazing staff behind um, the conference here at Colorado State University. And then also Dean Smith from the Association of Fish and Wildlife Agencies. We also had a great advisory board sponsors and of course, all of you attendees. I also wanna give a shout out to Bird Conservancy of the Rockies, a local conservation NGO that led the field trips that you all have been able to enjoy before and after the conference. Without any more ado, because I'm stealing his time, I'd like to introduce our plenary speaker this morning. A reminder to please save your questions for the end, wave down Emily or Paul for a microphone, and remember to keep them short and sweet so lots of people get a chance to ask them. Tuan Biggs is the Olajos uh, Goslo, I still didn't say it right, Chair of Environmental Science and Policy at Northern Arizona University. He focuses on developing partnerships between researchers and NGOs, governments, and the private sector that support and inform conservation actions and policies for the complex challenges of today's contested world. Juan is also the founder of Resilient Conservation. He was born in Namibia and grew up there and is and in South Africa's Kruger National Park. We should all be jealous. Juan has adjunct appointments at Griffith University in Australia and Stellenbosch University in South Africa. Please join me in welcoming Juan Biggs for his talk entitled Navigating Conflicts Over the Sustainable Use of Wildlife. All right. Thank you, Ashley. Uh, for those hoping I would sing like Ashley did yesterday, I'm sorry to disappoint you. It's not going to happen. And I am told I have a little less time than I thought I had, so um, I definitely won't sing. But it's great to be here, and thank you to Mike, Dean, Ashley, Becky, and team for holding and putting together such a vibrant, hopeful, and inspiring conference. As I understand from Tara Teal, this is a this is the fully the first fully in-person pathway since the pandemic. And it's so good to connect in person with colleagues and friends, so much better sharing collaborative ideas and inspiring thoughts in person than over Zoom. So, as was mentioned, I grew up in uh, this part of the world. If I step back, you can't hear me, can you? So I should stay forward. Um, Namibia and South Africa with these lovely animals. And from, after completing my master's at the University of Cape Town, I had the opportunity to do a PhD in Australia. And that was followed by a series of postdocs in Brisbane. And whilst in Australia, one week I was visiting a good friend and colleague east of Canberra there on the map. And we went for a stroll along the beach, looked a bit like that. It was really nice. Um, Beautiful, and as we finished our walk, we ended up 
in front of a house, a bit of a, well, actually a mansion that looked kind of like that. It wasn't exactly that, but it looked kind of like that. And we were waiting for, for my friend and colleague's partner to come and fetch us. And while we were waiting there, the owner of the mansion came out and spoke to us, greeted us. And what, what a lovely day. We're lucky to be in such a beautiful place. Um, and she said, no, she really cares about wildlife and she really cares about nature. And she's giving a lot of money to stop hunting of elephants and rhinos and other big iconic wildlife in Africa. And I thought, geez, well, that's, that's great that you're so inspired about it and excited about it. But I did wonder to myself, to what extent has this person, who clearly seemed to have a mutualist orientation, had it lived with or had lived experience of the difficulties of living with animals like elephants, when elephants are trying to compete with your cattle or your livestock for access to water, or lions that come and kill your livestock, and both species are potentially a risk to human lives. And especially when you're trying to defend your crops or defend your livestock, you know, people do get killed. And so to what extent did this person have that lived experience? Now, I understand her perspective and that these animals are special and that they shouldn't be hunted or killed. I understand that perspective. But if you've grown up living with the costs of these and of coexisting with these animals, you probably have a different perspective. And in Southern Africa, where I grew up, there's a strong domination tradition and uh, value orientation. And so if you grew up feeling it's your right to hunt these animals, provided you do so responsibly, then we're sitting with a bit of a challenge. And that's exactly the challenge we're talking about at this conference. And I was glad to hear in the early days of the conference, people talking about, well, it's not about mutualism or domination. It's about the mix. And it's about moving dynamically between a mutualist and a domination orientation in different times and in different places. But so now how do we govern this moving dynamic between or the, the, these diverging values on sustainable use in an equitable and just way. And that involves a, a dynamic moving mix. And this probably many of you would recognize is Lynn Ostrom. She won the Nobel Prize a number of years ago and has done tremendous work on governance. I was lucky to work with her uh, towards the end of my PhD. And her work and subsequent work provides us with some really good governance principles and ways of thinking about how we should govern changing values towards or go about governing changing values towards wildlife um, in an equitable and just way. So let's talk a little bit about what governance is. Governance is the formal rules and informal procedures and ways of doing things. It's about who makes and participates in decisions, and importantly, who has more power in those decisions. It's also about the distribution of costs and benefits from those decisions. And we're talking about governance of sustainable use. And when I'm talking about sustainable use, I'm talking about consumptive sustainable use. There are some definitions of sustainable use that include photographic tourism, et cetera, but that's usually not nearly as contentious as the consumptive sustainable use which involves hunting, consumption, live trade, or trade in animal parts. The governance principles that, in a nutshell, and summarized again in this paper that, that just came out, um, that I think we should bear in mind as we think about governing these changing and diverse values are that legitimate local scale governance is really important, that people affected by rules should participate in decision making. Um, and that locally led and driven rules for conservation last longest. So if a group of people feel that in their forest or their bit of savanna, no more hunting is appropriate and they come up with that rule themselves, that is going to last far longer than if it's imposed from the outside. And the third element is nested and multi-level institutions. And that's a bit jargony, but what it means is that in a global sense, your community-based NGO is supported by 
a district government and interacts with them, then provincial, then national, and then connected to international. So these levels of institutions are supporting each other and in the US from you know, local level, county, state, and national. So if we ask ourselves, how are we going on implementing these good governance principles for navigating the conflicts over sustainable use in this era of mutualism and changing values towards wildlife. And I must say, I've been very impressed over the past few days, talking to people, listening to talks, the work happening here in Colorado, Nevada, what's happening in Missouri. There's some really strong collaborative efforts to engage, understanding how people feel, engaging with stakeholder groups and trying to work out, well, how do we best manage our issues of bears, of hunting, of wolves? Now, so that's inspiring, and it's certainly very inspiring, especially if one's used to reading the news from this land where you sort of get the impression, well, everything's polarized. But if we think about governing sustainable use, especially of iconic wildlife outside of wealthy Western countries like this one in the global South, in my home continent of Africa, it is far more challenging. And that's my lived experience and what I've spent a lot of my time over the past decade or two working on. And so that's what I'll be talking about for the rest of my talk. And to get into that, um, I want to provide some history and background. And so we're talking a lot about inequity and justice in conservation, which is fantastic. I think as, as I move to this next part of my talk, a question I pose to you, what is one of the biggest but little mentioned drivers of inequity globally? Any thoughts? The map can give you a tip. Anyone? What, pardon? Colonial histories, absolutely. And so that, and which manifestation of colonial histories? All of them, okay, fair enough, they intersect. So, um, good point. <laughs> um, excuse me. So it's literally the country in which you are born, the passport you carry. Um, we had a little note in science a few years ago about how that entrenches inequality. So the biggest determinant of individuals expected income, well-being through their life is the passport with which they are born or that they have access to. Now, many of you or some of you may think, well, countries, that's just, I mean, that's how it is. But if we think back to, well, where does the European colonial era come from, the constructs during that time, nation states, countries that we sit with today are construct of that era, of the early days of that era. And in my understanding, the Treaty of Westphalia in 1648. But that informed the way the colonial process, as was mentioned there, happened. And so this was my home continent in the late 1800s, and the various European colonial powers carved up the continent of Africa with these superimposed boundaries with no regard for who was there, the people, the cultures, whether they'd fought each other before or not. And those are the boundaries we are still sitting with today. Now, if we zoom out to a global level, and there's European colonial history map um, and so the imperial powers of Europe in black and their various imperial colonies in the different colors and so if we look at that map and then we look at a world wealth map today where does the wealth sit in the world today um, barring a few exceptions like Japan South Korea some oil states and Russia the wealth mainly sits in those European imperial powers and societies and countries dominated by the peoples and the cultures of those imperial powers, like this one, like Australia, like New Zealand, like Canada. And so, and that is wealth. So that's more of a stock. That's where the money sits. And this also comes out in terms of the flow of income. So if we have a look here, upper income countries um, versus lower income countries, the differentials of income in this country between different groups and different segments of society are very 
sad to see. If we look at it globally, it's, you know, the magnitudes are far greater. 60 times average, you know, person's expected income annually in some of the countries like Malawi and Mozambique that we want to conserve elephants and lions in as compared to the United States. Um, so how does this inequity between countries affect debates on sustainable use of wildlife? Does it? It very much does. And I'm going to talk a little bit about how that plays out. And especially, and it's especially relevant if we're talking about an era of mutualism and changing values towards wildlife. So because the wealth sits in largely wealthy Western countries, and we want to conserve wildlife and biodiversity globally, often in the global tropics, we are dependent on flows of money from countries like this one to countries like such as those that I am from and other parts of the lower income world and the formerly colonized world. And these agencies that are indicated here, these are the organizations and mechanisms through which those flows of money take place. So NGOs and then some multilaterals like the GEF for Global Environmental Facility and individual nations, the wealthy nations all have their aid agencies or funding agencies that are sending money and often directed towards environmental and conservation outcomes like the GIZ and USAID. So what does this look like systemically? All right, so let's, let's focus in on NGO. Um, so we want to do conservation on the ground for lions or elephants in southern or East Africa. We need money to, to enable us to do that. So we start an NGO and we run some projects on the ground. So now we, how do we get money? We sell proposals and we sell images and stories of our successes of what's happening on the ground. Um, and if we do a good job, our donors are happy. Um, and the dollars flow, which enable us to keep doing our projects. But in my experience and the experiences of many I've spoken to, there's unfortunately a very weak connection and feedback back from what's happening on the ground back to the donors, be they wealthy individual donors, foundations, or be they government donors. And the distribution of costs and benefits is also unequal. Now, an example of this for government funds out of the United Kingdom. One of their funding mechanisms was to reduce illegal wildlife trade and stop it. And one of the apparently very good projects involved supporting local communities on the ground. I forget exactly the country somewhere in Southern Africa to you know, build capacity for managing responsible hunting. And the project met all the criteria, but the feedback was, well, this is a great project, but it doesn't pass the daily mail test. If the British public read in the newspaper that we as the British government are funding anything to do with hunting of these big iconic animals, we're out. So we can't do that. In the same way, if you, if my NGO was targeting that lady that I met, that I spoke about at the beginning of my talk, I mean, so I might wanna do the best thing I can for conservation on the ground as an NGO in Zimbabwe that may mean supporting hunting, but if I need money from her, then I'm going to be driven by her values more than I am going to be driven by the values of the people on the ground I'm working with. And this is a real challenge. And it plays out more on this lovely animal than on almost anything else, the African elephant. So I think bearing in mind what I said earlier, you know, where does the world sit? Therefore, where does the voice and power sit? What does that stem from the European colonial era and the path trajectories and legacies that established? So whenever there's a debate about conservation of elephants or maybe you know, things are in, involving some of the values we've spoken about here, mutualism versus domination, hunting of elephants, NGOs and stakeholder groups in this country, in Canada, in Europe, the United Kingdom, Australia, very vocal. They all have a very powerful voice. No, you can't do this. No, you shouldn't do that. Now, let's think for a while. When we talk about bison and wolf management here, or prairie dogs, 
Who from Zimbabwe or Botswana is here telling us what to do? No one. Um, and I think that's worth reflecting on. So moving forward with the example of elephants as a, I think, clearest manifestation of this challenge. This map is a few years old, but shows that the majority of the African elephants are in Southern Africa. Um, so, and specifically Botswana has more elephants than any other country, followed by Zimbabwe. Now, living with elephants, for those of you who've been uh, fortunate enough to see them, is not that easy. And so Botswana has a serious human elephant coexistence challenge. And due to some political changes a number of years ago, they, Botswana, reinstalled hunting of elephants as a acceptable practice. And understandably, very, very quickly, the Western world was up in arms. This is just not on. How can you, you know, start hunting elephants again? Um, and we condemn this practice. And uh, some of you may remember President Masisi at the time of Botswana said, all right, well, we'll ship them over to the United Kingdom and send you some lions as well. So you can see what it's like living with these animals. Another area, and I've spent a lot of time working in this area where this manifests in a very destructive way is the Convention on the Trade of Endangered Species, CITES. And so most... In my experience, and I don't know, those of you who've been at CITES COPS, I'd hope to hear perhaps that I'm a little biased, but I'd say 40 to 50% of the discussion at the CITES COP is dominated by the trade in ivory. And should it be allowed or should it not? And in the build up to every CITES conference of the party that I've watched, we have NGOs in countries like this one, and this is from the WWF website and they're not alone at all, they are fighting to end the elephant ivory trade. So please give us some money so we can stop Zimbabwe or Mozambique or Tanzania or Botswana, whoever it is at this particular CITES COP wants to sell ivory again. The, old la the, the lady sitting with, you know, retiree that has benefited and privileged from the economic situation in Australia and probably looked after her money well as well, but she's certainly in a privileged position. She loves to hear this. Ting, ting, here comes your money. I'm going to help you fight the, the, the trade in elephant ivory. So from the NGO's perspective, this is a very good strategy because we're getting some resources in. But understandably, the countries with the elephants, they're not very happy with this. So again, recently, the Southern African states have said, we're going to quit CITES. Um, they point to Japan leaving the International Whaling Commission as an example of what they're going to do because the de facto operation of CITES with respect to iconic mammals has shifted from the sustainable use of wildlife to not using wildlife. So that in some ways is a reflection of a change in values of, well, that domination orientation is no longer acceptable, but these countries with the elephants don't feel that that's what they signed up to. And um, so what are these debates when you know, on the floors of CITES COPS or in the, you know, the media discussions around them and some of the papers, what are the debates on the ivory trade? And it's very similar, if we're talking about rhino horn. Um, so the anti-trade side says, well, the, our only option is to ban the trade. We need to strengthen enforcement. We need to run demand reduction campaigns, and we need to destroy stockpiles of ivory and rhino horn so that the users know and understand that this is not something of value. The countries you know, like Southern Africa, where I'm from, they are, you know, hang on, let's have a regulated market and manage and sell our stockpiles. This can help us fund enforcement. We can engage the demand market so that they're buying the legal product. And importantly, this can fund conservation and poverty alleviation and rural development. So listening to these debates and trying to work out what's going on, I came to the conclusion, what they're actually talking about are these different values. Yes, there's real concerns about laundering. Yes, there's real concerns about how you would actually implement a legal trade. But 
actually, you know, these are the issues. There's people that feel that, well, no, it's just wrong. You can't, you shouldn't be, you know, like we shouldn't sell human teeth. We shouldn't sell ivory. Um, and versus the other orientation was, no, it's our right to do this. And so we had a paper out a number of years ago. Oops, sorry. I'll get to the paper. I got ahead of myself. Um, so we're sitting with this real challenge um, in terms of considering, well, the in the case of elephants, the money and rhinos, the money's coming from more mutualist oriented stakeholders, donors in wealthy countries like this one. Because the feedbacks are weak, the values and the realities of people on the ground. So whether this benefits their situation at all, or whether it actually works for elephant conservation or rhino conservation, that kind of doesn't matter all that much because the main feedback is the flow of dollars going into these organizations and the images and stories of success sold back. So one of the advantages of not having my talk prepared before I came to the conference is I was sitting out there and Dean Smith came up to me and he said, what are you doing? I said, I'm working on my you know, talk. I said, this is a real challenge we're dealing with. So he said, well, the real question to ask is how do we strengthen these feedback loops? And Dean mentioned to me that a few years ago, a group of NGOs and, and lobbyists in this country try to uplist the polar bear. So same way as elephants, this is a really nice story. Polar bears, iconic, they threaten, we need to uplist them. And uh, Dean's Association, the Association of Fish and Wildlife Agencies actually then with, you know, being in well-established and quite functional countries could as an association stand up and say, well, actually the science doesn't support this. And actually this probably isn't gonna be a good thing for people or for polar bears. And so it was turned down. When it comes to elephants, rhinos, in the part of the world I come from, there is no such association. So de facto, the groups in wealthy countries have a lot of power in terms of just, you know, dictating policy or driving policy. And I'm talking about, you know, elephants, and there it's really the mutualist oriented groups that are dominating the debate, but it could go the other way as well, because of the weak condition and the weak governance and the weak structures of, of those countries. So as Dean pointed out, how do we strengthen the feedback loop and importantly, incorporate values of the people on the ground that are living with elephants or you know, where the elephants occur? And the second question is, how do we make the distribution of costs and benefits more equitable? So as to the first question, the top right question, this is the paper that we brought out a few years ago where we were discussing that with respect to elephants and the ivory debate, which is really been a major gridlock within Africa and with, within the global conservation community for a number of decades now, if we bring values into the discussion in a structured way, maybe we can move forward. And so I tried to, when this came out in 2017, 2018, spoke to CITI, spoke to some colleagues in IUCN and suggested, well, how about we run this process and see if we can move forward? And there wasn't much interest. And then I started focusing on other things. We had the pandemic to deal with and moved to the, I moved to this country. And then last year, the African Elephant Specialist Group reached out to me and said, hey, do you want to do this or try and do it? And so I said, well, I'm, it's challenging, but we should try and do this. And so the process that we're running through now with the IUCN Species Survival Commission's Elephant, African Elephant Specialist Group is reconfirming and this is a summary of the process, reconfirming conservation objectives among key stakeholders, eliciting and sharing mantle models and associated values, and then looking where the evidence gaps are and agreed upon ways to find that evidence and then exploring trade-offs and seeing, well, what can we agree on? Um, and this is why in-person conferences are really good. So uh, the other day at lunch, I was sitting next to Laura and Justin from the Global Center for Species Survival. And we were talking about these things. I said, you know, what I'd really like to do as part of this process is really engage the people that are living with elephants because their voices are not adequately in these discussions. And uh, Laura and Justin pointed out, well, actually that's what you know, our role is at the Global Center. 
at Indianapolis Zoo is to support IUCN groups to collect necessary data like this. And so we're talking about the possibility of collaborating with them on this. And that's not something that I can see that would have come about if we had a Zoom conference. I don't think those sorts of interactions would have emerged. But so we're moving forward on this. And another way, and moving back to this slide, I'm working to try and strengthen this feedback loop and incorporate values is 30 by 30. Who's heard of it? Who's not heard of it? Most of you. The initiative agreed upon, Alex Zimmerman mentioned it yesterday, the um, Kunming Montreal Global Diversity Biodiversity Framework. And we're trying to conserve 30% of the world's terrestrial and marine habitats by 2030. And now this entails, if we do this, there's gonna be increased human wildlife conflict. And what human wildlife conflict does, Alex pointed out yesterday, it's sort of the tip of the iceberg. It elicits and it's actually just, yes, the symptom is the lion eating someone's livestock, but you know, there's all sorts of value differences and deeper identity issues underneath that. So I, together with Isla Hodgson at the University of Stirling, we have a task force within the World Commission on Protected Areas to really look at integrating human wildlife considerations into management and governance standards for protected and conserved areas, which is, from the IUCN's perspective, important as part of the drive to 30 by 30. And what I'd like to do as part of that is include explicit consideration of different value orientations, so we'll be working with Alex and her, and her specialist group and some Mike Manfredo is involved and some others. And I think what's really important as well is actually to get, and Alex alluded to this yesterday, site-based facilitators on the ground to help, mani to help manage and navigate these conflicts and, and difficult challenges we face. So I am coming up to the end of my time. So I've gone through a lot of material. What are some of the ways forward that we should bear in mind? I think firstly, and I think at conferences such as this, and certainly in my experience, both in this country and in Australia, there's not nearly enough mention of, not enough mention of this. And I think the time is right with our increased focus on inequity and dealing with inequity and justice and conservation is we need to recognize and talk about our privilege being here in places like this in wealthy Western countries and the real inequities and challenges faced by societies and people in these superimposed nation states from the European colonial era. Those nation states were never designed or constructed to be functional. All the investments in the Cold War make, made them even less functional, and, but that's the reality and we need to recognize that. We need to strengthen multi-level institutions and have global policies to strengthen global to local feedbacks. Importantly, strengthen and invest in local level capacity and organizations and supporting marginalized voices in decision making. And as this pathways conference moves forward and into perhaps back to my home continent at some point, I'd certainly be interested in speaking with the organizers as to how you know, I can support doing that. And importantly as well, fairer, more equitable and just distribution of costs and benefits. And so we're working on some community science initiatives that may that we hope would ultimately get some direct flows of resources and institutional building to the people that live with animals like elephants and lions. So I'd like to thank the organizers of Pathways for the great conference and some people for helping with the images and the slides. And so I think I managed to finish in my new, newly allotted time. And so I'm ready for questions. Thanks so much, Juan. Fascinating presentation and great job shortening it up on, on short notice. <laughs> <laughs> Who's got questions for Juan? Thank you. Um, interesting talk. Um, in this country, we obviously don't have human wildlife conflicts on the scale of elephants and lions. Um, we deal with deer and bears and things like that. that are almost inconveniences relative to, to elephants and lions. But we still kind of have the same debate about the use of hunting um, to resolve, um, to help resolve some of these conflicts. And the evidence that hunting does resolve these kinds of conflicts is mixed at best. And so in your talk, you went pretty quickly from 
human elephant conflict to elephant hunting to opening the ivory trade. Um, what is the evidence that doing any of those things, opening either opening hunting or opening the ivory trade, would diminish human elephant conflicts short of complete catastrophic destruction of elephant populations? Uh, thank you for that question. I think the um, to me, it's less about whether you open hunting or the ivory trade. It's about the structures in place to govern these differences in values. And so when I was here in 2019, I was driving northwards to Montana and I remember stopping at a gas station. I think that's how they called here in this country. And there was a little pamphlet and it was about, please support us to take on some motion that's gonna reduce our ability to hunt elk. And you know we're going to our Senator and they're going to represent us. And I thought, well, okay, so in this country, yes, the debate is a real debate, but there's institutions, there's systems to have a functional and robust discussion about this and functional representation for the different groups. When it comes to elephants and these other things and these, there's, there's va the values of the people on the ground, their realities, the cost they have to bear to live with these animals are walked over because of these power differentials created or you know, in the legacy of what's what we sit with now because of as a result of the European colonial era and its aftermath. And I think that's the issue. I mean, the, the, hunt, the actual hunting in ivory is, you know, we can talk about that. And, and, and I think one, maybe just the last point there is what we've struggled with and what our process within the African Elephant Specialist Group is piloting sort of a way forward is we've lost our ability to have a constructive science-based discussion around those issues. We, because at a fundamental level, those questions are about values and we're not, values are not on the table. We're not having a meaningful discussion. And we can see that through decades of, you know, back and forth in CITES and the uproars every time hunting is proposed or brought into place or taken away. We have one question over here, then in the front and then up the front. Hey, my name is Peter Sander from the University of Copenhagen. Thanks for a very thought provoking and brave talk. <laughs> uh, one thing you didn't mention is you made it sound as if science is always on the good side on your world. But the reality is, in my mind, that all of these contentious issues, the NGOs also work through supporting science. And actually, in the world, whenever you raise this issue, there'll be someone from the science having the opposite view. And actually has a huge effect on the public debate that scientists will, if you come out and say, you can do ivory trade, okay, then there'll be not tons of scientists going to the media saying, no, that's not right, our research shows something else. So, so the, in the world of science, there's also interest playing, playing a role. What, how do you see that? And how can you see that how we in the world of science maybe can become better at solving these issues among scientists and not sort of being useful idiots for interest on both sides? Uh, thank you. That's a great question. The, I think, and certainly, and I worked on this to some extent during the pandemic and wildlife trade and how to govern it. And very sadly, because at the fundamental level, these value debates and the value contention is what drove the debate. You know, that drove, so the one side was like, well, we don't think wildlife trade is a good idea, so we'll get a bunch of science that says that it's a bad idea. And the other side did the opposite. So what we need to do is we need to put in place um, and we need to try and reconstruct systems whereby we agree to the rules of the science game, so to speak, and we agree to those outcomes. And in the wildlife sustainable use debate, we've lost that ability. And that's part of why we sit with these, these challenges. And what we're we try to point out in that paper is that, well, values are central to this. So we need a process that incorporates science together with these value differences. If we are going to create a space where science once again becomes a useful boundary object to use that term for us to you know, decide, well, what do we, how do we move forward? Okay, thank you. Um, I'm thinking more about the description of running the process um, to incorporate mm -hmm. kind of in-country on-the-ground perspectives. 
And I'm wondering what that process might look like and thinking about facilitators to use in-country facilitators. I know it's really important to have these like third party mediators or facilitators, but if the facilitators are coming from privileged countries, can they be perceived as not biased, right? By in-country folks. And so just wondering a little bit about what those processes might look like on the ground. Right, so I think that's a very important question and whether it's with reference to, you know, achieving 30 by 30 and facilitators around human wildlife coexistence and conflict, or whether it's around elephants, I think that's a really important issue. And I think those contexts differ. Sometimes outside facilitators are better because they're seen as independent and neutral as opposed to someone who's local, but perceived to be from an opposing tribal group. But I think that's really, that's a really good question. And I think what we are trying to emphasize and I'm looking forward to talking with Alex as well, because, I mean, she emphasized it, this in her talk yesterday, is what we're really missing are the resources needed to have those facilitators well identified, you know, in Botswana, in the Okavango Delta, in Kenya, be they from, you know, the United States or be they from a neighboring country there in, you, you know, Uganda, but actually having resources to have them on the ground and help navigate some of these processes and those resources are not there and the commitment to that is not there. All right, thank you so much. Time's up. We appreciate you, Juan, for joining us here today and love that suggestion of a visit to Africa. All right, so we're not talking about going to Africa, but we are still talking about the next pathways. And for those of you who aren't familiar, pathways tends to, to swing between the US here in Colorado in particular, but sometimes elsewhere and um, getting to, to go out of the US. So I'd like to invite up our next speaker who's gonna give us a little preview of Pathways Europe in 2024, Dr. Jenny Glickman. And she's going to talk about how we're heading to Cordoba, Spain. So thank you very much. And yes, like it's a great pleasure and honor to be honest, to be the one future host, co-host of this conference because it uh, was one of my very first uh, conference uh, back in uh, 2008 uh, when I was doing a PhD and arriving uh, at Estes Park and seeing all this amazing work that everybody's doing in human dimension and how everything has been growing through. Uh, it's, it's fantastic. And it's, um, I've been managed to be able to attend uh, more than half of uh, pathways with some gaps uh, here and there for uh, either maternity leaves or <laughs> COVID or stuff like that. But it's, uh, it's fantastic to be able to bring uh, and co-host uh, uh, this uh, conference in Spain uh, next year in, uh, um, in October. Uh, I hope it's uh, not too much a clash uh, with the semester. Uh, it might be the starting of the semester, but we just decided uh, those dates uh, were better for uh, a more comfortable weather, not too hot <laughs> as it could be Cordoba. So um, <clears throat> they join us. So we have already some dates and I'm sure Emily and uh, we will start uh, posting in uh, uh, Twitter, in uh, Facebook, uh, everywhere to start uh, looking at uh, what are the days to start uh, uh, to be able to participate uh, for organized sessions. Uh, I mean, it seems already far to talk about March, but it's actually around the corner at the same time. So um, for individual uh, abstract uh, and poster will be in April. Um, and this is a co-host, uh, not only from my from the organization where I work, which is a, a um, Institute for Social Science uh, um, in, uh, in Cordoba, but also with the University of Cordoba and obviously uh, Colorado State University. Um, <clears throat> so which will be the theme of this uh, future uh, conference? Uh, um, is revisiting what is wild for coexisting. So, I, and I think it's a trend that we can see 
uh, around these uh, uh, years uh, of pathways, looking at uh, um, maybe uh, uh, what was uh, the last uh, one in uh, in Netherland of uh, um, uh, sharing landscape uh, and here the era in mutualism, but. Sometimes we need to think about and step back a little bit on actually what is wild, what we are thinking uh, when we are talking about uh, inv invasive species. Uh, how do we treat uh, as well like uh, free ranging domestic dog, uh, dogs or cats, uh, or uh, when we talk about deer in, uh, in the city, is it wild? Is this still wild or what? How can we consider these uh, different aspects when we are talking about uh, coexistence uh, and uh, um, in treating these uh, uh, spaces, protected areas, and as well more green spaces in urban areas. Uh, are these wild, uh, wild spaces? Uh, and obviously coming from a more European perspective, uh, how about uh, wilderness? Uh, are there still spaces uh, that we can call wilderness? Uh, so we're trying to look at all these uh, aspects uh, and obviously uh, all what it belongs to in a, in a more conflict and coexistence situations uh, uh, in the next uh, uh, coming conference. So we look forward uh, in coming you uh, with uh, opportunities uh, to share um, where the field uh, is uh, driving us into these different aspects. And uh, so I'm just really going to be really short in, uh, in showing a little bit uh, where Cordoba is and where Spain is in case uh, uh, you're wondering. <laughs> so uh, Cordoba is in the south of Spain, it's in Andalusia. And uh, even though Cordoba itself doesn't have an airport, it's actually really well connected from Madrid in the north, Seville uh, in the west, uh, and Malaga in the south. And there are really fast trains uh, that brings you to this beautiful place. As you can see, uh, the one, the big picture is uh, um, the Mesquita. So in this part of uh, Spain, we had uh, um, the Arabs uh, uh, staying uh, for a long time. So they bring us uh, an amazing uh, uh, culture and an integration of different cultures, uh, of coexistence uh, of different religions at the same time between uh, Jews, uh, Muslim, and Catholics. So it's also a, a great opportunity for different aspects uh, and uh, amazing, obviously, cannot say, uh, wine, olive oil, <laughs> food. So hope uh, you can join us uh, next year. And I think that's it. Thanks, Jenny, really looking forward to it. Now I'd like to invite Dr. Mike Manfredo to the stage to say a few parting words. Thanks, Ashley. <clears throat> Thanks you all. I'm going to talk as though this, th this is over. And it's not, we have a whole day today, right, of sessions and go to them and enjoy them. But since this is our last plenary, I just wanted to have the opportunity to thank everyone. I think it's been one of our best ever pathways. And that's all because of you. And we greatly appreciate your attendance and, and participation. And I don't know about you, but the wine stuff got me going to Cordoba. There's no doubt in my mind. Um, I do want to just say thanks again. You've heard a lot, but but there are a bunch of people that made this special, and the hosts, Ashley, Dean, um, uh, then um, who else am I thinking of? Rebecca, Becky Nymek was also involved in that, and the the advisory board was super, and uh, so we just had a lot of participation from terrific people. And I'm going to put them on the spot a little bit more. Emily, come on up here. And Paul, where did Paul try and escape? Oh, what a shame. I should have given him a warning. You get his too then. 
I figured, what can I get this woman? She's going to Europe after this and she's going to enjoy herself. And I felt like flowers weren't right, but I'll tell you what she could use. And that's a bottle of champagne that she could celebrate this being over. So here you go. Thank you. No, thank you. And, and I'll tell you what, can you take Paul's wine? I figured Paul, Paul needs to warm up a little bit for the, for, the, for the Spain conference. So I figured that's what we do there. Okay, enjoy the rest of the day. Thanks again. Watch for the Cordoba uh, advertisements. And, um, and then we'll be talking about having pathways again year after that here in the US. So thanks again.